Hartman Hovanavor, Dignity Health Glendale Memorial Hospital. I'm Dr. Minayan. I'm a neurologist uh, with subspecialty in vascular neurology. I practice at Dignity Health Glendale Memorial Hospital. Today I want to talk to you about memory care and the five factors or tips that could prevent memory loss. And they include diet, exercise, stress uh, management, mental stimulation, and good sleep hygiene. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the first time I saw you in the first time. The first time I saw you in the first time, I saw you in the first time, I saw you in the first time, I saw you in the first time. I saw you in the first time, I saw you in the first time, I saw you in the first time. Այս էչը այդ ծավալի որեր են մեկն է, իմ հույսս է և աղոտկս է, որ այսպեսի էչ չի բադահի մեր ժողորդին համար։ Այսօր մեր հյուրն է աննա տրկոյտը, ուն մասին միտոխոսին, կսում գայթի և ազրբեջանի հայգգան չար� Հազարի նարությունութ թվականի պետրվարի 27-29 նայնկած ժամանակա ատվածում խողորդային ադրբեջանի սումգայիտ կաղաքում ադրբեջանական իշխանությունների կողմից պետական մակարդակով կազմակերպված հայ ազգաբնակչության եղր Երեք որ շարունակվող սպանդի արդյունքները զարհուրելի էին, ճարդարարների գործողությունները անորինակ դաժան։ Պաշտոնական տվյալներով մի քանի տասնյակ, սակայն իրականում հարյուրավոր մարդկային զոհերկայն, որոնց Երկո ազարտասնութ թվականը նշմարում է այս ողպերգական իրադարձության 30 միատարելիցը։ Այսօր մեր տեղավարում հիրնկալել ենք ամերիկա հայ պաստաբան, գրող հրապարակախոս, իրավաբան և մարդու իրավունքների պաշպանության տասնամյա աննայի ապրումներն ու հույզերը, տագնապներն ու սարսապները ել գտան արտակսում ոչ մի տեղ վերնագրի ներքո լույս ընձայված գրքում։ Աննա աստվածատրյանը մարդու իրավունքների պաշպանության, հայազ գիտեմ գործած բրնությունների և լերնային գարաբաղի ազգային ինքնորոշման ու անկախության թեմայով բազմիցս հանդես է եկել միացյալ նանգների կոնգրեսում և եվրախողորդում։ Մեծապես նպաստել Իթիվս այլ պատվոմրցանակների իր գործունայության համար աննա աստվածատրյանը Հայաստանի Հանրապետության նխագա Սեր Սարկսյանի գողմից արժանացել է մխիթար գոշ պատվոշ կանշանին։ լերնային գարաբաղի Հանրապետության ն Anna, welcome to my Thank show. Um, this is a sad uh, page in our history. Mm -hmm. It is a sad anniversary, 30 year anniversary of uh, this terrible tragedy that happened to the people in Sumgai, in Azerbaijan, as well as the Armenian nation. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened? Yes, um, so uh, Sumgai was a, a, a city uh, about 30 minutes uh, north of Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan. And it had a very uh, large Armenian population um, and uh, right on the coastline. Um, during the um, February of 1988, when Artsakh um, uh, people um, decided to rejoin Armenia uh, using the um, Constitution of the Soviet Union. Uh, legally, um, the response of the Azerbaijani government at the time was the massacres of Armenians in, in Sumgait. It started in Sumgait, and then um, about nine, ten months later, Kirovabad, 
uh, in November. And then uh, Baku in um, 1990, in January of 1990. So Sumgaite was the first uh, of the many atrocities that happened in a, about a year and a half uh, until all of the Armenians were ex expelled from Azerbaijan. So this was just a response to the demand of the Armenian population in Karabakh. That yes. they said, uh, we want to join Armenia. Yes. And this was like a revenge started it overnight? Was, it was a response, but it was also uh, uh, instigated uh, by propaganda, uh, spreading misinformation about Armenians of Azerbaijan uh, to start this movement of expelling. And also perhaps, um, you know, by doing that, uh, threatening Artsakh um, people from uh, going any further. And, and joining, uh, trying to join Armenia. Uh, trying to secede and join Armenia, yes. And this was during the Soviet Union. Yes. It was not, it was not disintegrated yet. It was the Soviet Union existing at the time. Yes, Soviet Union uh, existed. Uh, we had instances in 1950s and 60s where there were uh, anti-Armenian actions, violent things in the villages. And uh, my, my father actually on the way to Sunik region uh, remembers uh, being in the train uh, from Baku to um, Armenia uh, through Karabakh, uh, through Artsakh. And the elders, the older uh, adults, would guard the children with their bodies because there would be Azeris walking by and could stab a child, and that happened before. Wow. Um, so there were sporadic instances of violence, but it was always put down or controlled by the Soviet power system, yeah. by the Soviet system of friendship of nations. So when this happened, and it was in such large numbers and so horrific, uh, Armenian population thought it would just go away. How big was the Armenian population in Azerbaijan at the time? Uh, so by all counts, between 300 and 400,000. It's a large population. It's very large, and the majority of them lived in Baku. In Baku. And the Armenian population was a thriving uh, community that yeah. was successful, educated, like everywhere else Armenians are. Yes, we were the elite, you know, intelli elite. In in intelligentsia, mm -hmm. um, educators, uh, lawyers, engineers, you know, um, half of the buildings you can point to in Azerbaijan now, majority of them were uh, destroyed, but um, you can point and say an Armenian architect built this. Built or um, now. Armenians, obviously, because being the Christians and the Azeris were the Muslims, so we were kind of isolated, right? We didn't call married or, or we were kind of distinct population, right? They can easily identify who the Armenians were. I could say that about outskirts of Baku, but I wouldn't say that about Baku. Um, there were intermarriages. Uh, Yes, we were Christian historically, but because of the Soviet Union, we were not allowed, obviously, to practice our religion. Mm -hmm. There was an Armenian church, but we weren't practicing mm -hmm. Christians, and Azeris weren't practicing Muslim either. Right. Um, we were not isolated in the sense that we were our own community, and, and um, we had friends who are Azeris and Russians and Jews right. and I Greeks. I mean, it, it's coexistence was there prior yes. to this. Yes. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, take exactly what happened that day in Sumgai. So it was a, 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 about two, two and a half days of massacres of Armenians just going into an Armenian home. They knew where the Armenians lived. They knew where Armenians lived. And that was the case in Kiravabad and that was the case in Baku. So from, you know, just the witness accounts, uh, from my own experience, uh, we know that they knew where Armenians lived. Uh, the atrocities were not just let's kill an Armenian. It was torture, mutilation, um, killing right in front of, you know, the mothers or the fathers. Um, there were instances of just um, humiliating, um, you know, a woman running down the street uh, pregnant and, and, you know, mutilating her body and killing her. and. Um, that was the case that kind of haunts me. Um, she was 25, and her name was Lola, and and uh, she was killed in the field. Um, so 
Um, so Since there. This was a Soviet Union time. Yes. Where was the Soviet police, or the paramilitary, or the military to defend the citizens? Because after all, even though they were Armenian by ethnic background, they were citizens of the Soviet Union at the time, and the government of Soviet Union have duty to defend its uh, people and the population. The police was there, obviously. Um, the military was there. In every instance, there was a presence of Soviet troops somehow. But you know, they didn't interfere in this massacre. They didn't place. interfere um, to, stop. to stop it. And, and they were always, you know, statements that we got there too late. Uh, when there were tanks on my street, on my right in front of my dining room window, uh, my grandmother and my grandmother would, uh, you know, uh, grandmothers of the of the you know the the neighborhood would bring food to the troops and ask them if something happens if people come to get us, can you please protect us? And they say we have strict orders not to interfere. And these were, you know, troops uh, shipped out shipped from outside of uh, Azerbaijan who were not there, you know, for a long period of time. They just came in. They, were, they did not interfere. The they did not. Chase idle and these uh, uh, violent acts happened and they were just simply not interfering or to stop it. They I were not say. interfering. They were there because the movement of Azerbaijan to secede from the Soviet Union began. So they were there strictly to stop that movement and not the killings of Armenians. And that was always, that was always our sense because um, the demonstrations that passed by our house uh, were going to the London Square to protest uh, Karabakh and also protest, you know, seceding from Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan seceding from the Soviet Union. And they would bring these wooden boxes to burn because they camped on the Lenin Square. Hmm. And the troops were more concerned with the burning of the square and defacing the Lenin statue than they were the Armenians being killed down the street. Um, so we were alone, we were isolated, uh, we were surrounded by people we, we didn't trust. Do we trust this neighbor? Do we trust that neighbor? It wasn't a, a community that could protect themselves um, in a, you know, all living together. We were spread out. And it was a city of two million people. Um, it's a large city. Yes. A large city. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come yes. back, we're going to talk um, if there were any self-defense by Armenians. Did we ever try to defend ourselves or simply, you know, um, we didn't have any means to protect or defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that in, when we come back. Absolutely. Seyir Pagamner, Garç Tatar'a mehre bir iber atanak mer haydakrin. Seyir Pagamner, Aysova mer haydakirne, Sumgayti pogromnere, gam Sumgayti çartı, yev Aysitari yeresun darine Sumgayti çartı intirpek tapar. Anna, just before we took a break, we were talking about if there's any acts of self-defense by Armenians, uh, or, or simply we didn't have any means to defend ourselves. Well, of, of course. I mean, that's a human reaction, right, to defend right. yourself. Um, of course. One of the horrific memories I have is my father lining up all the knives on a kitchen table, and I asked him what it was for, and, and he just kind of shooed me away, but... Um, mumbled that, you know, if they come, I will take a few of them to, the, to heaven with me and, you know, to the other side with me. Um, I, I, all the fathers um, who have, of, in those situations obviously were readying themselves. Uh, in the Soviet Union, we didn't have guns uh, to protect ourselves, but, you know, even if we did, when you have a family hiding in an apartment building, in an apartment, two, three bedroom apart apartment, uh, with the children behind and the wife behind, imagine a thousand of them bursting into it. And that's True. exactly what happened. Um, there's no firepower that can stop them. They were ready to kill. And, and then they, they had more weapons. Um, there were 
there were Azeri families that saved Armenians. Um, and I always, in all my presentations, want to note that you know, all of my work that I'm doing is, is, is not against the Azeri people. There were some really good people, and one family saved, I mean, people, saved us. People I mean, lived for years together, together. so there were some families uh, that protected, hopefully, yes. some Armenians. Yes, so, but, but then there were neighbors that lived next door to us who called the thugs to come and... To because, attack you. Because they were, you know, impressed with our apartments and the things that they were inside. They wanted to take our Armenians. Yes, they, and they moved in. Uh, how many people died that day or that in, in, in some guy? Is there official numbers? Because there, I heard different numbers right. when I was doing research. Uh, the official numbers are in the 30s, but there were so many accounts of ambulances um, coming back with the dead bodies, just, you know, one after another. And, and so it's, it's somewhere between... 30 and 200, but we, we can't know. In that over a two day period, right? Yes. That, that these, yes. These, who stopped it? Was there any action by the, the Soviet police or the military to stop these atrocities? I, I think it was it was basically stopped by you know the the, the Soviet troops that apparently were two days late. Um, to arrive. Uh, you know, honestly, I that's a very good question. I I, I don't know if the people that uh, were doing this, uh, achieved their purpose and stopped, or if it was some other interference. Um, but the troops were, I mean, the military presence was there after. I did read uh, in the materials that there were, the population of the Armenian population in Sumgait was 17,000 at the time. Yeah. Um, what happened right after this? Did the population left? Or so the b first further wave, atrocities happened to them. First wave of refugees out of Azerbaijan was Sumgait. Those people left. Um, I have my uncle was was a witness to. Um, he was there either around that the last day or the day after, and he saw the um, the aftermath. And he came back from to Baku. He was in Sumgait uh, for work. He came back to Baku, packed up his family. Within a week, they w moved to, Mos uh, to Moscow area. Right. And so the you know, majority of uh, uh, our Armenian refugees in the United States are from Baku. They were the last ones. That left Baku. So yes. some guys were the first. And they went to Russia. Russia. Yes. So Baku was next. Yeah, and or Russia or Armenia. Uh, yeah. So Kirovabad was next. Kirovabad, uh, Kirovabad happened right next. before. How big is the Armenian population of Kirovabad at the time? Do you, I really do you... don't know. Kirovabad was much smaller than smaller. Baku. Uh, so okay. I would assume it was a smaller population. Well, majority of Armenians from Azerbaijan were uh, in, you know, living in Baku, in Baku, in the center. Were there, obviously, you mentioned your father trying to uh, protect himself and self-defense. Were there any acts of any self-defense in, in Baku or uh, in Gorobad or other towns? Of course, yes. By Armenians trying to protect themselves from this mass murderers that are coming trying of to course. kill, take their properties and, and, and so forth? Yes, majority of uh, the people that you know, escaped alive, were uh, protected themselves um, or hid for months at a time in the dark. Uh, you know, one of the things that I keep hearing in all my travels is that uh, Armenians didn't defend themselves. Armenians of Baku didn't defend themselves. They fled or they're cowards or, and, and it's re-traumatizing my people of course. Um, because you're, Victim blaming, right. um, and if you just imagine a city of two million people, everyone's living in apartments. Um, in the seventies, a lot of the Armenians that lived together as a community received apartments throughout the city, and I and we believe that that was just to disseminate everybody, um, so that it wasn't a ghetto of Armenians mm -hmm. together. Um, so if you understand the layout of the city the layout of the Soviet system and how people live together, you would, you would instantly understand there is no way for many of us to defend ourselves when we were surrounded by, I, you know, the, the masses that I personally saw, um, 
there is not, there's not, I mean, a tank maybe would defend mm -hmm. you, but nothing else. In, in, in Baku, you said there's two million population. Yeah. What was the population of the Armenian people? In Baku, about 200,000. So it was 200,000, or maybe what, about 10% uh, yeah. of the population. That's a big population. It was. And um, they fled the city? Everybody. They everybody fled? Yes. Um, is there any acts uh, of defense by any armies at the time, just before the armies left the city? Or the population here is so, the, the Azeri is so big, it's almost impossible the way you explain. When you the say layout. defense, explain. At least self defense, maybe I mean. Well, the ones that were touched by those masses were killed. Were killed. Okay. Um, I would say that if you, um, I, um, you know, don't openly talk about this, but uh, it is in my book. Um, I was attacked uh, when I was 11, and I didn't tell my parents because I knew my father would kill that man. And if he killed that man, then we would be all dead. Dead, yeah. Because if you... So you were afraid as the victim to say anything. Of course, yeah. So they were acts of defense, and um, Heroic. but you would get retaliated against, retaliated absolutely. Against. Um, so what happened afterwards? So, you know, the massacre at some guy, the police came two days later, kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. Walk us through, what's the next step that happened there? Baku was different instantly. It felt different. Um, I describe it in my book, and, and which is a diary at the time. Um, and we felt instantly um, something was different. We were identified as Armenians, not just as um, Bakinsi, you know, everybody says Bakinsi is a nation, it is a nationality. nationality. Because it, we, people were very proud of being from Baku. Uh, and it, it didn't matter who you were, you know, as an Armenian. You were Armenian. Yeah, but now you are an Armenian. And my friends at 10 years old identified me as an Armenian. That was very new. Um, and some of them stopped playing with me. Uh, we didn't go to the seaside, and we lived on the beach in the summertime mm. in the 1988. Didn't go to the seaside because there were instances of Armenians being drowned. So my parents just avoided it, and they would never explain to me why we didn't go. And I would say, why aren't we going to the beach? We're not going to the beach. So they were waiting for this to subside, but then in the fall, it happened in Kiribati. And Kiribati Armenians uh, lived together, so there was more of an effort to uh, protect themselves and defend themselves. So um, in Baku was different. We were spread out. And then Baku happened in January of 1990, and that was the last. So by that point, so after Kiribati, 1989 was, was dangerous. Um, my parents were trying to find a way to leave. Uh, it was very difficult to find where do we go, where do we live. And by August, you couldn't be an Armenian and walk down the street. Um, in September, we left. We left. Okay. We're going to take a very short break. When yes. we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit, if you remember prior, if there's anything that, that was, any signals there, uh, and, and how long the Armenian community you know, lived and coexisted mm -hmm. in, in Baku and, and in Azerbaijan. We'll talk about that when we come yes. back in a few minutes. Sayyid Pagam Nair, Gars Tatarem, Hede Bidi Beratarnak Nair Haidatrim. Sayyid Pagam Nair, I saw one Mayor Haidakirne, Sumgaiti Charter, I saw Yere Sundari, Yagaze Sumgaiti Charter, Merekne, Anna Turkoita, Yavat Masin, Meng Zurutsenk. And uh, this always, uh, you know, it, and I asked this to my grandmother, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because we as Armenians live in Turkey, my family, my grandmother's family, for about 600 years, basically, in, 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 in Adana. And I always ask this question, prior to this massacres in 1915, in our case, mm -hmm. when they massacred the Armenians, and in, 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 in Sumgait and Baku case uh, 30 years ago, there were 
a peaceful coexistence between the Armenians and the Azeris. Or maybe it was Soviet Union, it didn't matter, I don't know. But it, was there any type of coexistence between these two nations? There was, but it was artificial. Artificial. Um, I believe so. Um, in, you know, going back to my grandfather when he was five years old, 1915, he fled Hanzaresk, Sunik region, mm -hmm. um, and they fled to Baku with his sister. His parents passed away. And they, in 1918, there was a massacre of 30,000 Armenians in Baku. And they fled, he was eight years old, across the Caspian to Turkmenistan. Uh, Russian boats um, smuggled the Armenians. Uh, lived in Turkmenistan about three years and then went back to Yerevan. Uh, went to university, you know, uh, grew up and uh, went to serve in the military and in World War II. After World War II, he came back and looked for work. And at the time, there was no work in Yerevan, but there was work in Baku. Baku. And he went back to Baku. Yeah. So this happened in my family three times. But he felt after two instances of Armenian genocide and the Armenian massacres in Baku, he felt safe to go back because the Soviet had a strong hold on the you know, the types of uh, attentions that existed. Um, but it was all covered. You know, you were never allowed to really discuss Armenian genocide. Uh, you, you know, it didn't exist. And, and you never, ever bring up the fact that Armenians were killed in Baku in 1918, or 1905. It, it was just... It so just that part was kind of erased. Erased. And there and was no... So you no, could not discuss, talk, no. do anything about it. So, you know, a lot of people say it was, uh, you know, political play uh, that this, you know, propaganda instigated. But I, I truly believe there is this inherent hatred toward Armenians because there was no justice. There was no um, discussing of what happened even. Even during the Soviet Union. Yes, yes. Where you're not supposed to discuss religion. You're not supposed to discuss ethnic uh, backgrounds. Yes. So that was suppressed and it was just this hateness by the Azeris towards the Armenians. I don't think it was hateness, but I think that there was mistrust of some sort. Mistrust. Because, I mean, in Azerbaijan, you could go all the way up, you know, you could succeed, but you could never be the first. So your boss will always be Azeri. Azeri. Because but I'm the Armenian. the Armenians were successful. I mean, yes, they were educated, absolutely. professional. But we knew our place. So it kind of attracted uh, hateness, you know, basically. Yeah, and, and, but there were, uh, you know, there were intermarriages. And oh, there were intermarriages. In, there were intermarriages. There, a lot of the refugees that came, that fled, um, you know, many of them are mixed families. Even Azeris um, had to leave because their children are Armenian. And so, you know, I, I, I think that the coexistence um, in Baku, at, at least, um, you know, m my family had, friends who are Azeris, uh, but we were always the second, and I think... Were there Armenians in, in the government? I know you said second, but were they allowed to have positions within the government? You know, honestly, I don't Because it know. was a Soviet system, so right. you're not supposed to, uh, you know, you know, and, and, you know you, you're supposed to be based on your, not religious background, based or on your... Yeah, exactly. I mean... Because you're a Soviet citizen. In a perfect world, maybe. In a maybe. perfect world, right? <laughs> I, I'm sure there were Armenians within the government system, but they are not decision makers, that's for right. sure. So the Azeris were controlling it. Absolutely. So, so even during the Soviet system, there were discrimination against the Armenians. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, but not violence. My, so violence happened when the Armenians in Karapakh decided that they want to... Yes. Uh, join Armenia. Basically, right. that was kind of, you know, revenge. So that's why you have the 30th anniversary of the Ar you know, Artsakh movement right. and the celebration of it. And then the same few weeks, 30th anniversary of Sumgai. Sumgai. Same time. Same time. Uh, were there any Armenians from Baku or Sumgai or Kirovabad went to Artsakh? M yes. Moved to Artsakh? Yes. Many are Armenians from Baku are from Artsakh originally. Oh, they are originally, okay. Yeah, their families are from Artsakh. So the biggest um, 
popul well, you know, if you look at the casualties of Artsakh war, the biggest, um, you know, minority of non Artsakh Armenians were Baku Armenians. Baku, Baku Armenians. And they fought. I have a very close personal friend, Saro, who uh, his, you know, grandparents were from Artsakh. He was serving in the military as at the time of Baku atrocities. Um, the minute he could get out, he f went and fought in the Artsakh war. Where, where is the population, if you have any stats? I don't know whether you do. Uh, there was 200,000 in, um, you know, in Baku and maybe another 200,000 around other mm -hmm. cities. That's 400,000 population. Where is today that population? Majority of them are in Russia. In Russia. Um, I think the majority of them ended up in Armenia uh, initially. Initially. They had just, Armenia just experienced the earthquake in 88. Um, the war, the blockade, um, no it's hard electricity. To stay there. So the refugees from the north, from their earthquake, the refugees from Azerbaijan, and so the you know there were no jobs, there's no housing, and many of them are not farmers. So they you know they couldn't go to the to villages. The, exactly, you know. they couldn't go to the villages because and survive. Because the, the population of Baku were you know highly educated yes. Armenians. And so many of them could, well, and also they didn't speak Armenian. So there was oh. discrimination against Baku Armenians in Yerevan that I experienced. Um, and I think that that was just a re re reaction to the changes. The Soviet Union is collapsing, all these people coming in, there's no food, there's no electricity. And so, you know, it was just and combination. And they don't speak Armenian. And they don't speak Armenian. And they miss Baku. How can that be? Right. Baku, which is <laughs> an enemy, go back to Baku. and you can't go back. So how can you love Baku? Mm. And so we were, you know, we experienced uh, all kinds of uh, trauma. Um, Where did your family go after these massacres? Yerevan. Yerevan. So you stayed in Yerevan for three years. Yeah. For three years, from Yerevan, you came to United States. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So majority of them are in Russia. There are some that are in Armenia, and they've, you know. Some of them are still live in refugee housing, which still, is still till today. Still, thirty years later. Yes, absolutely. And I, I just visited them in November. Um, they are, you know, they're struggling. And the, uh, you know, I've been trying to ask the government the question: Why are, why are the Armenian refugees from Baku are still in the refugee housing? Why are Gumri um, citizens still live in, uh, you know, earthquake shattered houses? Um, so it's 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 a painful point. That's why many of them left. Um, they couldn't find jobs. They couldn't find housing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are about sixty thousand of us in the United States. That's a big uh, yes. population living yes. in the United States. Sixty thousand. We're going to take a very short break. When we come back in our last segment, we're going to talk. How could we avoid another massacre? Yes. And and how could we educate our own next generation because that was 30 years ago I mm -hmm. mean this is not fresh in people's mind and how could we defend we still have uh, you know threats against Armenia mm -hmm. by Azeris till today so how could we you know avoid these things and, and we'll be back very shortly right. Sir Pagamner, I saw Bamir Haidakirne, Sungaiti Charter, Gam Sungaiti Charter, if I saw Bamir Hurne, Anna Turkoita, or Azadwazi Atteren. Anna, just before the break, we were talking about, uh, you know, the, these horrible, horrible massacres that happened to the Armenians. Sitting today, 30 years later, I always worry. Is something like this would happen again to us mm -hmm. anywhere in the world where Armenia exists? If we forget, yes. I mean, look at what happened to my grandfather, you know, 1915, 1918, and then again in 1989 to my family. Um, we are people that want to want peace. We're creators. Mm -hmm. uh, we thrive anywhere we go. And we want yeah, to as a business, as very successful businessmen, educators, you know, 
artists, professionals, exactly. artists, very and, successful. And so we want to we want to live peacefully wherever we are. Um, and then we want to think good of people. Um, but we also need to remember that things like this do happen. It happened in my lifetime. Yeah. It happened... Um, I mean, this was in 1915. No. This was very recent, even 30 years. I'm not that still, old, right? Yeah, I know, we're not <laughs> that old. So, I mean, you know, when my grandmother used to tell me stories uh, uh, from 100 years ago, I keep thinking maybe it was 100 years ago. It just still seems unreal, right? Unreal, right? But this happened recently. Just and in a, in a very, you know, in a very metropolitan way. city. In a, in a modern city, uh, you know, with with the Soviet Union existing at the time. Yes. Yet there was massacres, horrible, horrible over massacres, and over again. Over and over again. So Baku, I mean, I always say, uh, if if Sumgait was handled properly. Uh, Kirovabad wouldn't have happened. If Kirovabad wasn't handled properly, Baku wouldn't have happened. And so, so these things were escalating because there was inaction or, or you know, probably uh, for a specific purpose. But we as a people trusted the government to protect us. They never did. And they never the did. Soviets just simply stood idle and let the Armenians be massacred. Yes. So they only rolled in, you know, and and put down these these masses of of thugs that were killing innocent people because um, of the cessation of Azerbaijan movement. So uh, so what do we do to make it not happen again? I travel all over uh, the country and the world, and there are Armenian communities that have never heard of Sumgait. Um, that's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this because you know, it's uh, to glorify any of it, um, just to educate. And, and I think that we, we also need to remember that we are, we have Artsakh that is going through this now. Right. And we Artsakh, have threat today. We have 150,000 people in an open air prison. Open, exactly. It's that the Azeris, which is what, 8 million today? Yeah. And, and it and can happen again. And they can attack again. Artsakh any day. And they do. They attack, you know, you, you saw what they did in April of 2016. Right. They, the young kids who are protecting the borders, 18, 20 year olds, are constantly killed. And so we need to be proactive. We need to engage our political leaders. We need to call our legislators when things happen. We need to protest. Are you active in the United States trying to lobby our congressional Absolutely. leaders? Absolutely. And the government, the United yes. States government, as an American citizen, that look, you need to help us in, in, in yes. Armenia, in Artsakh. Yeah, I spoke on Capitol Hill twice. Um, I reach out to, if there is a state level resolution, anti Armenian resolution, you better believe Baku Armenians are talking to their legislators and, and stopping those anti Armenian resolutions. Uh, we need to be more, you know, we need to engage on non Armenian. Uh, friends to be our allies and we we're very good at isolating ourselves. Uh, I think we need to reverse that uh, We need to bring Into our world non-armenians who will fight our fight because that's really the only way I believe So you decided after going personally through these Horrible experiences as a very young person 10 11 years old your family going through this tremendous tragedy and being expelled from your homeland, your coming to the United States, decided to de dedicate yourself to educate and, and lobby the United States? No. Uh, no. The first 22 years, I decided to forget it. And I tried to forget it. Um, it, was so, it was so painful. It was painful. I didn't go to Armenia the first 22 years. I didn't want to remember the horrific you know, experiences, we, how we lived uh, as subhumans um, in Armenia after we had nothing, we, lo we lost everything. And then my, you know, I, I became a mom and my first boy, Armin, was born. And then my daughter, Evangeline, was born. And when she was born, I saw myself in her and I started thinking, you know, there are so many children like her who don't have the opportunities that she does in our, you know, living in Artsakh and constantly threatened and this, horrific thing that happened to me is happening to them 
And, you know, we thought, well, where is the diaspora when we needed them the most? I don't want to be that diaspora that I, you know, ignore this um, um, horrific thing that's happening to them. And so I, I, I was reached um, to publish the diary I had as a child. It was a historic record. It was written at the time that it was happening. So it's so a real time. You were just writing it down. Right. So the book is based on the diary entries. I published it. I thought that that's the good I can do. Uh, but I started getting invited to all kinds of places, non-Armenian, Armenian, all over the world. And I realized how that story written by a child is so valuable in delivering that message because any, anyone can pick up a history book mm -hmm. but when they read this they relate to the family on a personal level and they engage it's also therapeutic for Baku Armenian community that's been largely for them you know for the most part they feel that they've been ignored and their tragedies is second to some of the other things that Armenian community is working there, on. Maybe the Armenians in Baku because they went through this tremendous experience Maybe they were uh, traumatized of course. to talk about it. I mean, that's what happened to the Armenian genocide. For 50 years, we couldn't open our mouth and say anything. No. We were so scared. Like my grandmother, yeah. was, we went through the, the genocide, went through the uh, exile you know, in, in Derzor. Yeah. She wouldn't talk about it. Even no. 50 years later, it was so traumatizing for her. She didn't want to taint her children. Exactly. And that's what's happening. You, you know, My father would say, don't write this. You know, why are you worried about it? You know, live your life, and you know that's why we brought you here. And and they don't talk about. It. There was no. We don't have a culture of talking things out. We no, have a I culture know. of moving on and succeeding, and you know, happy happy things. Right. Uh, but they don't. You know, they didn't address for 30 years some of these feelings. But what I'm seeing now, I just came back from San Diego, and I had an event there with a large. Uh, you know, audience of our Ar armies from Azerbaijan, and they came to me telling me their stories, and it's, it's, it's Painful. at this point so easy for me to talk about my story because I've done it so many times. But to hear their stories is so painful, but it's helping them, and they know that there's someone that's working on it, someone that's paying attention, and and. Um, and then they say, you know what, I'm going to write my own book or I'm, you know, I, I do this or my daughter is doing that. And so they feel like they're being recognized. Um, so, Anna, from a personal standpoint, uh, are you going to continue this advocacy, so to speak? I've done it for six years. I don't know. No one stopped me yet. No, no it's not. <laughs> I will. I will. Um, I, I've fully, What's next fully dedicated. Well, I... I my goal, I, I will only stop when Artsakh is in fully independent. Uh, what's next for me, I'm, I, you know, I'm a professional banker. Um, I have two children. I'm on the, my you, city's... You're teaching your children about... Of course, yes, yes. All this uh, yes. Armenian history and atrocities. Atrocities piece, they're 8 and 11. So I'm still too, too young. young. They know that this thing happened and they know how it happened, and they've been to Armenia. They, um, you know, half Armenian, but they're full Armenian in their mind and heart. Um, and they're watching their mom do all the th these things. Um, perhaps they don't understand it yet, but I, I know that they're very proud of me. What is your, um, we're, we're coming to end of our show, but it was uh, uh, very painful for me to, um, sit and, and, and just watch uh, the, the, these atrocities. What can we do that these things, as, as Armenians, would not happen to us? Is there a solution to this? I mean, this was 1906, mm -hmm. 1908, mm -hmm. uh, 1915, the Sumgait in, in Kirovapad, and, and still we're facing, you know, today, I'm scared to death, and I pray every day mm -hmm. for protection of Artsakh because they're at danger today, tonight, when we're talking in here in the United States. So I will tell you that there are probably many different solutions. Um, there's the utopia of all of us living in Armenia. Of uh, that's probably not realistic. 
Um, and then there is a realistic um, solution is defend our borders, um, thrive. Our soldiers are doing it there. Absolutely. Pay in 24 hours every Absolutely. day. And I've met many of them and many of them are wounded. Uh, many of them missing limbs um, and 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 um, so I I think that defending our borders, making Armenia thrive and become independent, um, not depend on others to protect us, and and I think education, um, and not just knowing your history, um, but also knowing your neighbor. Um, you have a neighbor who is a Baku Armenian, uh, reach out to them. And yes, maybe they don't speak Armenian or they uh, look a little different or, or they cook look the different, same. right, <laughs> right? But they cook something different from you. Um, reach out to them. I think that's really the solution. Um, we're coming to the end of our show. I am very thankful for your courageous story. Your family's you. courageous story, and, and I'm just proud of you as, as Armenian. Thank you. Staying in the United States and, and advocating uh, the Armenian cause. It's a noble cause. Thank and you. And I'm so proud of you. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much Thank for, you. for being on my show. Thank you. Thank you. Sayer Pargam Nev, I saw Vahida Kira make a pageng, Yev Bidi Hachorting Bidi Hantibeng, Kisher Pari. Northman Hoganabur Dignity Health Glendale Memorial Hospital. <laughs>